Today, a new worldview is being promoted through movies, television, public education, and best-selling books. Leaders in government, medicine, psychology, religion, and science are embracing it. People at all levels, from kindergarten to PhDs, are being taught how to reach altered states of consciousness, how to achieve mystical experiences, and how to contact their own spirit guides. Has man discovered the new laws of the universe? Is it now possible for him to tap and unleash dormant divine powers within himself so he can achieve health, wealth, and happiness? Is it really true that what we imagine we can actually bring about through positive mental attitudes and positive confession? Many people are saying we are on the threshold of discovering a new age of human development, an age of one world government, a one world religion. Are they correct? Or are we on the verge of seeing a tidal wave of deception? what the Bible calls the big lie. Has the Christian church been seduced by and warmly embraced that which is really old-fashioned sorcery? Are visualization, guided imagery, and healing of the memories all neutral mind powers that Christians should use? Are occult phenomenon they should avoid? Tonight we'll be discussing these questions with Dave Hunt, occult researcher and author of the new book, The Seduction of Christianity, and Johanna Michelson, one who for many years practiced and taught occult techniques and is the author of The Beautiful Side of Evil. Please stay tuned. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. We have two folks on stage, Mr. Dave Hunt and Johanna Michelson, that are talking about a great deceptive lie that is crossing America, that is being imbibed by the secular world as well as the Christian church. It's hard to believe what we're talking about, but we're documenting it as we go along. I'd like to give you an example. I think the last time, Dave, that you were with us, we had world-famous Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the one that uh, is the psychiatrist from Switzerland and the doctor, medical doctor from University of Chicago. And she was talking about the fact that as a psychiatrist, a medical doctor, working with those that are, are, are in the process of dying, and now she's got 100,000 courses that are being taught to our hospitals, our nurses and doctors, concerning death, dying, and transition. She added the word transition in the last few years because of a mystical experience that she had that she described to us on the program that she said she saw some fantastic things that gave her unconditional love, she, she, she painted the whole picture for us. At the end, I asked you what you thought about that. That experience changed her life and motivates her to continue helping others. And you told her that you felt that she was absolutely deceived, like she had been deceived in other things that were written up in People Magazine, etc., in the Los Angeles Times, and that this was another case of a power that the Bible calls Satan, masquerading as an angel of light, giving those experiences and giving a complete philosophy that goes with that experience that she is passing on in these hundreds and, mm -hmm. and hundreds of courses that are being taught in America. Now the scientific community, like Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, is saying things similar. Mm -hmm. Mystical experience, Shirley MacLaine comes out with a book, Out on a Limb. Mystical experiences have changed her complete life. What she used to think was wacko, now she talks about openly. And she admits that. Why? Because she experienced it. People in politics, Mueller at the, at, the, at the United Nations, these people have had real experiences, and you're saying this is part of the lie. Lead us on from here and tell us about what you're talking about. Well, John, it's easier than ever for Satan to deceive people now through experiences uh, because the experience doesn't even have to be real. I mean, if I start to talk to a person, well, how can you e evaluate this experience? Do you have any objective basis? Are we willing to evaluate it on the basis of some objective truth? That's irrelevant anymore because the psychiatrists are telling us that a vividly imagined experience is just as real as a real experience. And therefore, you imagine, you fantasize. That's the name of the game today, you know, any number of therapies. Let's get involved in fantasy role-playing games and let's fantasize and imagine ourselves as, as something. It's amazing. We were talking about Napoleon Hill, and 
uh, what he was taught by these masters and what he did. Napoleon he, Hill wrote the book, Think and Grow Rich, right, that's on sorry. the newsstands across the world. Go ahead. Right. The granddaddy of all the positive mental attitude, success, motivation. Courses uh, that are going on. Volumes, right. Given to him by demonic entities that materialize in his presence. What they taught him was visualization. We got these powers within us. And we said uh, one or two programs ago that in the occult, there are three techniques of mental alchemy transforming the world. Uh, thinking, more powerful is speaking. When you enunciate this, you get these vibrations, as Johannes said. And the most powerful is visualizing, because now you create a vivid experience with, within your mind. And they taught him to visualize nine great men out of the past, nice fellows like uh, Voltaire. Thomas Paine and Voltaire and Napoleon and so forth. And in his mind, he sat them around a table. Napoleon Hill said that they became so real. They were more real than reality. They had their own personality. They each spoke with his own voice. It was so real it frightened him. And he discontinued it. And then he reassured himself that after all, it was only imaginary. And so he went on with this. And he consulted these nine so-called imaginary beings, demons, materialized right there as he opened the door to them. They gave him advice that made a multimillionaire out of him. He consulted them for his clients. And they gave advice that made millions for them. Uh, and so he was very successful. Success through a positive mental attitude, he wrote. Now, these ideas, amazingly, are being picked up and are coming in the church. We're beginning to visualize. Uh, visualize what you're praying for. Uh, visualize Jesus, even. And, and I'd like to get into that in a moment. Do it. Who's but, saying that we ought to visualize any of that? Let me first of all just give you a little more okay. uh, uh, documentation from, from the occult. Um, I'm quoting here from my uh, medical doctor, Mike Samuels, um, and he's giving us a little of the history. He says the Egyptian followers of Hermes believed that, and Hermes is a mythical god way, way back there, so you're going way back in history, believed that everything is mind. Disease could be cured by visualizing perfect health. Then he comes up to the Navajo Indians. They have elaborate concrete visualizations in which they bring about healings. And he talks about Paracelsus, a Swiss alchemist, and he talked about visualization. Psychic healers Bill Hankin and Amy Wallace today say that visualization is the most potent technique. Uh, I mean, I've got a lot of them we don't have time for. It. Shakti Gawain, in her book, Creative Visualization. Uh, she says, you've got to, you can create your own reality with your mind. Now, let me quote a Christian again, Norman Vincent Peale. He says, quote, there is a powerful and mysterious force in human nature. You see, it's no longer God. We're not looking to God, but looking to a potential within us. In human nature, a kind of mental engineering, a powerful new old idea. Yeah, it's new age is the old occultism. The concept is a form of mental activity called imaging. It consists of vividly picturing in your conscious mind a desired goal or objective and holding that image until it sinks into your unconscious mind where it releases great untapped energies. And then he says, you create reality with this. Now, Robert Schuller, in the foreword of The Fourth Dimension, a book by uh, Paul Yonggi Cho, who I'm sure is a fine Christian, but he can be deceived just like I can be deceived. Uh, and in that book, he advocates visualization. And he says, this is how God created the universe, by visualizing it. And since we are in God's class, we are fourth dimension beings. We, too, can incubate and hatch reality like a hen hatches an egg by visualizing in our mind. And we bring it into existence. And if you're praying for something, you're not going to get your prayer answered unless you visualize vividly uh, what you're praying for. And that's going to bring it about. And in the foreword of that book, Robert Schuller says, I've tried it. It, it works. works. <laughs> Don't try to understand it. Yeah. Just do it. it. It works. So these ideas are coming in the church. Now we've got some problems. Uh, Norman Vincent Peale in his book Positive Imaging tells how he first learned this from, um, I think, a, a board of trustees member or someone like that who suggested that he go out and get $5,000 donations from a number of different men. And, and Dr. Peale laughed. You know, he's telling me they're going to laugh at me. Uh, well, he says, you go out, and I will visualize them writing out a check for you. So he goes to the first gentleman, 
who, when he asked for $5,000, laughs at him. And uh, then suddenly he says, um, well, I'll do it. And he pulls out his checkbook and writes out a check for $5,000. And Dr. Peel, very ecstatic, goes back to this gentleman and says, he did it, he did it. He, he wasn't going to, and he suddenly changed his mind. And his friend says, of course he did. I sent out a powerful thought hovering over you. It hit him between the eyes, and it changed his mind. And this ought to change your mind, too. Realize from now on, you begin to visualize uh, what you want to come to pass. Well, we not forgetting about the occult. We've got a bit of an ethical problem here. Yeah. I mean, I can make people write out checks for $5,000 to me uh, by visualizing what I want. Isn't that I the old can... definition of sorcery? Yeah. Absolutely. Joanna, give us the definition of sorcery as you used to teach it. Well, as I used to, well, I never taught specifically about sorcery. I was more involved in the practice of it, although I wouldn't even have recognized it as that at that time. But sorcery, basically, is the attempt to manipulate forces to do your bidding, to do your will. You know, there are many different ways of achieving that. But I used to do that, for example, in my acting class. We used to sit down and have exercises where the people would stand behind you and try to direct uh, images at you. And you would be able to perceive what they were picking up. The theory being that if you can pick it up, you can send it. Right? And then I would go out into the dining room and I would try and force people to do what I would want them to do, and they would wind up doing it. That's the basic of sorcery. When you try to manipulate individuals to or do God. your bidding, or God, mm -hmm. and that's the next one. Give us other examples, then, of uh, visualization. Well, visualization, the woman who brought this into the church. Agnes Sanford. Primarily, Sanford. Agnes Sanford. Agnes Sanford, I've got a lot of quotes. I mean, she has probably influenced the church. Give us one. More than, than any person in this century. Who are the people that uh, she's influenced? <clears throat> Some of the people that she's influenced, I'm quoting now from a book... Uh, by John and Paula Sandford, who it's the transformation of the inner man, which is the pre premium, the book, the greatest book, the uh, most complete book on inner healing. Okay, and I'm quoting them now. Uh, they say Agnes Sanford was for all of us the forerunner in the field of inner healing by prayer. And she was also our own first mentor in the Lord, our friend and advisor, a sound church woman. She founded the School of Pastoral Care, where many pastors, doctors, nurses, and others came and learned. Among them were Francis McNutt, Barbara Schliemann, Tommy Tyson, Herman Riffle, Paula and myself, and I could name many, many others. Robert Wise, for example, a pastor in Oklahoma City. Uh, any number of others. Rosalind Rinker was heavily influenced. Uh, Ruth Carter Stapleton was heavily influenced by Agnes Sanford. Now, this sound churchwoman, as they describe her, who was their mentor in the Lord, let me just tell what did, you. What some did she of the teach? All right, what she did she taught. teach? She talks about Jesus lowering his thought vibrations to cleanse the thought vibrations that surround this globe. That's a Telhardian, uh, Telhard de Chardin idea. Therefore, he became a very part of the collective unconscious of the race. That's a union idea. And therefore, a a uh, certain emanation of an invisible and personalized energy of our spirits has already ascended into heaven. His blood, that mysterious life essence, remains upon this earth in plasma form, blown by the winds of heaven to every land beneath the sun, exploding in a chain reaction of spiritual power. She talked of God as this flow of energy. She talked about the high voltage of God's created creativity. She said, we are part of God. He's in nature. He is nature. She, she was, uh, you know, uh, give me the word. Well, it's pantheist, basically the pantheist, right. The pantheist, right. Uh, God is all and all is God is she, what you're saying. Right. She called him primal energy. She talked of Jesus of that, as that most profound of psychiatrists. How did Jesus uh, heal then? How does God heal, according to Agnes? By mind power. And we do it by visualization. And she says she's got no quarrel with savages in the jungle who dance themselves into a trance or with the mind science people who deny the reality of evil. But she says, that's not the route I go. How then shall I create in myself the atmosphere of faith, the feeling that God is answering my prayer? The method I use is the training of the creative imagination. She talked about the wise men of India. I'm quoting her now verbatim. For many centuries have trod the lofty peaks of spiritual powers and given birth to their oversouls, spirits of the dead for whom we have prayed are on earth working through us. And you convey this healing power by visualizing, you can even redeem a person by visualizing a sinner as a saint. Uh, she said that her work had grown too large 
uh, for her to do it. And she says, the Lord has therefore guided me to a broader and more subtle way of prayer. It baffles me in a way because I cannot tell what my spirit does and whither it goes, but that it does travel and that God does work through my spiritual body out there in the astral plane, you know. Even when my mind is quite unaware of it, it becomes more and more apparent. Well, she learned that by visualizing her children, she could literally control her children like Norman Vincent Peale learned, that he could get somebody to write out a check. By visualizing them, she could control her children uh, and create a reality. She is the one that brought visualization and inner healing into the church. That's no different than what I had. I had some of the people from Ekankar on the program, the great Ekmaster. That's exactly what they said right. that he did to them right. Right. from this Eastern cult there. Now, Don't you have... ask me, how could a woman yeah. like this... I mean, look, I'm not quoting. I, I've given you a fraction of the quotes that are in the book. This is not tucked away in some obscure paragraph on a back page. This is rampant throughout, throughout the whole, her, her books. Johanna's got her books right in front of her. Now, how is it? I mean, John, I'm sitting here, and I, you don't know what this sit, does to me. Why must I, or Johanna, tell this to the church? Why does one of our major ma Christian magazines quote a whole chapter out of one of her books recently? I mean, what's going on? Well, all I can say is Jesus said there's a deception that would sweep the world. There's an apostasy, and people would be blind to it. And that's why I feel I must awaken and arouse the church to what ought to be obvious to everybody. Okay, you know? we're going to take a break here, and then we're going to come back for, for more of this. And we want to talk about this and, and people saying inside the church as well as outside the church that the, fin the final potential that we have is that we are little gods. And they tie that in in all different directions. We want to talk more about that. We come right back. Please stick with us. All right, we're back. We're talking with Dave Hunt and Joanna Michelson concerning the great lie that is sweeping across America. Part of it is coming in through mystical experiences where the demonic is giving people under all kinds of disguises information that they think is wonderful. As Johanna said in her book, evil is beautiful. As uh, some people we've had on our program, they can't believe that there would be an evil power out there giving them the most wonderful experiences that they've ever had. And yet that's taking place. The, the sad part is that the church that ought to know better is starting to take some of these techniques and starting to teach it under the guise of Christianity when the Bible says no. We're trying to awaken those of you that are in the church, those of you that are born-again Christians that believe the things of the Bible. Look at the Bible. Examine what we're saying and see if this is true. Let's move on here with the area of imagination. You know, it doesn't sound like something we grew up in Sunday school with, but yet people in the church today are saying, Go to your imagination. The answers are in your, your imagination. Johanna, tell us some about this. Well, let me give you a quote, first of all, from The Spiral Dance by someone uh, who calls herself Starhawk. She's a Wiccan, a pagan. Uh, we would know them more a simply witch. as a witch. Quite true. And in her book, uh, on page 148, she says something that's very interesting in talking about keeping dreams and guide logs and whatnot. In keeping a dream log, remembering dreams, sharing them in the coven, and re-entering them in a trance, or a guided fantasy are all ways of opening the door without a key. So the occultists, and there are many quotes on that, will tell you that the fastest way to develop occult powers, Silva Mind Control does the same thing, is through developing the power of the imagination, through opening up that door which puts you in the altered state of consciousness through which you can uh, develop these things. And yet, uh, while they will tell you it doesn't matter who or what you imagine, you also see that in the Christian church, uh, C.S. Lovett, for example, who's a pastor in Southern California and an author, uh, has said uh, something that was startling to me when I saw it. He said, the most notable and glorious purpose of the imagination is to give reality to the unseen Lord. So Christians have taken techniques that are used by occultists to develop imagination, to develop ways of seeing, translated that into saying, well, let's Christianize it. Let's imagine the Lord. You want to know that Jesus loves you? You want to know that he's real? All you have to do is sit down, count yourself down, center yourself, and picture him. Picture an image of him. And what's more, he doesn't care how you picture him. You can picture him in his seersucker leisure toga. You can picture him in dungarees. You can picture him in a business suit in now, whatever people way. Say, people say, and, and I want to come to you, because before you were ever a Christian, and when you were actually... Uh, practicing or, or going toward the mm -hmm. practice of being a full-fledged medium, mm -hmm. uh, doing fantastic, if you want, miracles, okay? When you were going that direction, not any part of Christianity, you had a spirit guide that you named Jesus. 
Well, you see, I believed at the time that I was indeed a Christian. You know, John, I accepted the Lord as my personal savior, and I want to give this as background. My freshman year in college, before I got involved with mind control, before I got involved with the medium in Mexico City, before I got involved with yoga, I committed my life to him, and I believed I was a true, genuine Christian. So that when, in civil mind control, they said, well, who do you want your counselors to be? I said, well, of course, I want Jesus. What better counselor could I have? to give me information, to guide me, to lead me on my path to evolution, right? Because by this time, Jesus had become, for me, my great guru, my great guide, my way to God, my avatar, but certainly not everybody's way. By that time, that was too narrow-minded, dogmatic, Bible-thumping, and fundamentalist. And you had a sister that was one of those. I had my sister who was definitely one of those, and I gave her a pretty hard time about it. But when uh, we were presented with this, I said, yes, what better guide could I have than Jesus? And indeed, when we went into our psychic laboratories and mind control, where you we created were that in down, your mind, a place that we created in our mind where we could go to to develop our powers, to help people, to send transmissions that would help the world, even as so many of the people in the New Age now are doing sending transmissions, I decided to image Jesus. And I brought down a special door, and there he was, Jesus, in all his glory, with lights shining about him, and a sense of feeling and experience of holiness that was beyond description. You know, I can empathize with Kubler-Ross when she says, you know, I had this experience. How can you tell me that, oh, that these beings and Shirley MacLaine and these people who give you uh, their uh, experiences life left. after life. So this Jesus was very real. He was definitely there. But it was something that was absolutely demonic. Because when it finally occurred to me after a long series of circumstances to test him according to the word of God, I found that this beautiful, ecstatic, imaginary Jesus that I created for myself is the wrong one. That's what's happening in the church. Are they contacting the real Jesus or are they contacting a spirit guide who calls himself that? We're going to have you tell your whole story uh, in a couple programs here. And it's really something, and you've left out all the gory details of what you just said that you will tell a little later on. Dave, give us a cap, capping of what we're talking about. This has come into the church. People are having Jesus spirit guides. We're visualizing Jesus. What's wrong with that? What do we do? Well, they're visualizing Jesus, but the Bible never tells us to do this. <clears throat> it's not taught in the Word of God. And my Bible tells me that, that when Jesus suddenly appeared to his ten disciples after the resurrection, it was a miraculous event initiated by him for his purpose. And the doubting Thomas, who was not present, had to wait a week before Jesus, in his own time and way, came back and allowed him to put his fingers yeah, in the hands. He couldn't visualize him on the, on the spot. Image. We're being taught that doubting Thomas needn't have waited five minutes. All he had to do was visualize Jesus, the real Jesus, Richard Foster, in his book, um, um, the Celebration of Discipline, on page 26, tells it. It's more than imagination. The real Jesus will come there. Calvin Miller tells us. Uh, the doorway into the, into the world of the spirit of reality is imagination. imagination. You visualize Jesus any way you want, but any occultist, as Johannes said, will tell you the fastest way to pick up a spirit guide is to visualize anything. You've got to ask yourself a question. Protestants would be a bit upset to know that inner healers, because in inner healing you visualize Jesus and he comes back and, and clears up the traumas in your past and so forth. Catholic inner healers get just as good results visualizing Mary, Mary or, Joseph. Uh, or Joseph. Other inner healers get just as good results visualizing Buddha or a coyote, uh, some of them. So you're going to have, have to ask yourself, if, if why is it, can, can we be sure that this is really the real Jesus? He never said, I'll be there. We've got Jesus on a string if we can make him appear anytime we want. And it's tapping into ourselves, the imagination, and we better remember the warnings in the Bible. Uh, Jeremiah, for example, tells us, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And Jeremiah, any number of times, warns about those prophets who do not speak a vision from the Lord, but they have a vision out of their own hearts. And God says, I have not sent them. They've spoken from their own imagination. And when we think we can imagine, and whatever we imagine, no, never mind what vision it is, what, what he looks like, Jesus will have to step into this and make it real. We have taken occult techniques and tried to Christianize them. That is deception. And next week, we're going to let it all hang out, and we're going to talk about the broad picture of what's happening across our country and the world. So please join us. Welcome.
We have as our guests two people that are talking about a lie that is crossing America. It's very dangerous, and we want you to know about it. And tonight we're going to take it from an aspect that we haven't taken it any week before, and that is this. In the Holy Bible, you will find some amazing statements. We'd like to jump from that into the topic tonight. There's a statement that says this, that when the final wrap-up comes on earth, that those in Russia, those in China, those that are Moonies, those that are Jehovah's Witnesses, those that are Marxists, those of all cultures, the Muslims, you name it, are going to unite and there's going to be one world religion. Now many people that say that the Lord Jesus Christ, looking at scripture, talking about his returning to this earth, many people say that that's coming soon. You've heard that. But what they might not have told you is that in Thessalonians you will find that before Christ comes back again, the apostasy, this turning away from the faith, this getting ready to have a one world religion must be on the scene. Where do you see it today? Could it happen quickly? Those are some of the things we want to talk about tonight. Dave Hunt is saying that it's among us already. There's a seduction even inside of Orthodox Christianity that's taking place among some of the most well-known Christians that we know, men that are sincere about the Lord Jesus Christ but are teaching some things that come right out of the occult. Dave, let's start A. How in the world do you see a one-world religion coming among atheists, the Russians, the Chinese, and all of the cults? We have 4,000 or more cults in our own country, America. How do all of these people come together under one banner? And what is that banner that's taking shape right now? Well, John, it's interesting that not just the Bible predicts this, <clears throat> but... Um, any number of secular leaders today. For example, I'm quoting here Jean Houston. Uh, she's supposedly one of the most brilliant women in the world today. Margaret, Man Margaret Mead's mantle has fallen upon her. She's known as the dazzling visionary scholar, teacher in the human potential movement. She is a, a past president of the Association for Humanistic Psychology. She has PhDs both in psychology and theology. And she says, uh, quote, in, a, in an interview, I predict that in our lifetime, we will see the rise of essentially a new world religion. I believe a new spiritual system will emerge. Now, this is not only Gene Houston, but many other people. Are Who else is saying it, Dave? This prediction. Well, we've, we've got some of our astronauts that are making these statements. Um, it's uh, Robert Mueller uh, At the United of Nations. the United Nations uh, has made similar statements. What's his position? He's the Assistant Secretary General in charge of the 32 divisions of the UN around the world, UNESCO, UNICEF, and so forth. And what is he saying? Uh, he's talking about a new genesis in his book, New Genesis. Uh, he is a Teilhardian, actually, uh, Teilhard de Chardin, the uh, paleontologist, uh, Catholic monk who was declared a heretic by the Catholic Church, which forbade him to publish his writings, uh, is called the father of the New Age. Uh, Marilyn Ferguson, in her book, The Aquarian Conspiracy, polled 185 New Age leaders, and most of them said it was Teilhard de Chardin who brought them into it. <clears throat> and he talked about the human race is evolving through the noosphere, the theosphere, to finally we will merge into godhood at the omega. Omega point. Now, but what is making these people in government, in politics, in science, in medicine, what is persuading them of that? Well, <clears throat> it's in fulfillment of what Jesus said, of course, that the last days would be characterized by the greatest deception the world has ever seen, a religious deception involving false prophets, false messiahs, and false miracles. But They don't uh, believe that. Why do they believe what they're saying? Well... I think if we traced it in modern times, of course, some people have always been saying this. They've been working towards this for a long time. But it suddenly exploded in, in the Western world in the 50s and early 60s with the drug movement when our young people dropped out to tune in and turn on with drugs. Now, 
the significance of that, the altered state of consciousness that they achieved. Um, Sir John Eccles, Nobel Prize winner for his research on the brain, describes the brain as, quote, a machine that a ghost can operate, unquote. Uh, sorcery in the New Testament indicates sorcery would, would be revived. There are two Greek words for it, magia, Simon the magician in Acts 6, a sorcerer, uh, magic powers, black magic, white magic, uh, whatever they want to call it, and pharmakia. A sorcerer takes consciousness altering drugs in order to contact spirit beings to gain supernatural powers. This is the whole spirit guide thing that we're talking about. They got it first on drugs. That. Um, what did they get on drugs? What you're saying is that they had an experience in drugs. They wouldn't call it demons. They had mystical experiences of contact with spirit entities that initiated, some of them were initiated to transcendental meditation on LSD. Getting the same information from the spirits about cosmic consciousness, about the unity of the exactly. world, about the direction that their personal evolution had to take, that people were getting through the revelation of transcendental meditation. And in fact, that was kind of a jumping off place. People said, what do we need to take drugs for? We'll just join TM yeah. or the other meditation yeah. uh, mind center. Go groups. into that. TM came in, you have yoga, you have these things, mm -hmm. and they also gave us this altered state of consciousness, which from our viewpoint is simply the fact you're making contact with the spirits, you're making contact with the demons out there that are giving you information. Now, what kind of information are they pulling in? Well, another word for the New Age movement is the consciousness revolution. And they're telling us that everything is in, in states of consciousness. What we need <clears throat> to do is to achieve a higher state of consciousness. The only difference between Jesus and us is that he had a attained a higher state of consciousness called Christ consciousness, cosmic consciousness. When we attain this state, God consciousness, we become Christ just like he is. Uh, there's a New Age synagogue, for example, not far from where I live, Machom or Shalom in, in uh, the valley, San Fernando Valley, the Los Angeles area. Um, the uh, Ted Falcon, the rabbi, says the moment is going to come when the cry will go out, will the real Messiah please stand? And we will all arise and the world will be transformed because we are all the Christ if we only knew how to tap into this and look within us. So when you attain these so-called higher states of consciousness, um, this is uh, helping us in an evolutionary step, which they describe as a quantum leap to a higher state of consciousness. We won't sprout wings, uh, you know, uh, it's going to be a spiritual thing and a transformation is coming and they say it's going to come through an emergency uh, they talk about emergence through emergency a new species is literally going to be um, uh, evolved on planet earth called homo noeticus uh, when Edgar Mitchell that I referred to earlier came back to this earth and joined the inner space program the new frontier of modern science he founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Uh, noetic coming from the Greek word nous, the stuff of which everything is made and we are it, uh, you know. So okay. let, me, let me see if I could uh, summarize some of the things that you've said before, Dave, and, and, and jump off of this, okay? You're saying that this worldwide deception is coming. It's coming from a couple areas. Philosophically, you've got the nuclear movement because we're thinking of the world that could, it could perish because of nuclear war. Mm -hmm. So people are getting together and say we need a one world government. Other people are saying we also need a one world food supply. We need one world in money so we don't get ripped off in the cards, our, our, our plastic cards and so on. So the fact is, some of these ideas are good in themselves, but what people that are saying it do not realize is this parallels what the Bible says there will someday be one that comes on the scene that sets this up, okay? But he will also control the world for evil purposes. But they don't see that. That's part of it, just a philosophical mm -hmm. mindset where people are saying we want a one world everything. You had the rock concert not too long ago where, you know, coast to coast uh, and, and country to country, <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, you have people saying, hey, we're one humanity, we're one people. Now, along the way, you also have your psychiatrists, your atheists, your people that are having mystical experiences like the mm -hmm. astronauts. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this book, The Aquarian Conspiracy, she talks about people all being glued together from different backgrounds by these mystical experiences. Mm -hmm. Now, these mystical experiences, from what you're saying, is the fact is that the demonic is giving these wonderful, beautiful, mystical experiences mm -hmm. which comes with a full-blown <laughs> Eastern mindset, all right? Now, you put that together with these people that are saying that uh, they want a one-world everything, and the occult comes in and starts to lead in that same direction. Now, take it from there. Well, Revelation 13 <clears throat> makes some incredible statements. It tells us that everybody is going to worship the Antichrist. 
You see, when you talk about the Antichrist taking over the world in the last days, most people are interested in uh, the latest uh, <clears throat> plot of international bankers uh, to create new money, or the Trilateral Commission or the Council of Foreign Relations, or political maneuvers or military maneuvers by the Soviets and so forth. But the takeover by the Antichrist is primarily a religious, a spiritual uh, uh, um, event. Yeah, the toward thing, which Satan has been plotting since the Garden of Eden. The thing that you say <clears throat> amazes you is when you look at the words, all will worship him. Everybody. If that means all, it talks about all the cults, all Buddhist, the different countries. Hindus, Muslims, So what kind of worship Chinese. is it going to be? How do you get these diverse people together? All right. <clears throat> now, they're going to worship a man as God. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 tells us about that man. He's going to sit in the temple of God and declare that he's God. Now, the primary application of that would be the temple that would be rebuilt in Jerusalem and the Antichrist sitting there, but you have a secondary application. It's telling us the religion of the Antichrist as clearly as you can uh, ask for it. Our bodies are supposed to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. What? No, you're not. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have of God. You're not your own. For the first time in the history of humanity, across the Western world, millions of people, through yoga, transcendental meditation, are looking within what ought to be the temple of the Holy Spirit to discover the true self and having found the true self declaring that self is God okay this man is not saying that he's God in the classical biblical sense it says he exalts himself above all that is called God or all that is worshipped he's an atheist so that he is God sits in the temple of God showing himself it says self-realization discovering to himself that he is God <clears throat> now there's a transformation coming I believe uh, that's going to cause the world to accept this because he will be the first one to demonstrate that this goal of godhood is attainable he's going to have the psychic powers and the world is going to want to follow him now it also says in revelation 13 the whole world will worship the dragon an entire world involved in satan worship but of course they won't call him satan most of them a few satan satanists will but most of them will call him lucifer this is a a popular idea. You know, <clears throat> in, in masonry, it's been around for a long time, you get the highest levels of masonry, you find out that Lucifer is the good guy, the god of light and, and good, and Adonai, the Lord, in the Bible, is the god of evil and darkness. But <clears throat> let's take a recent film, 2010. Right, it's coming into our uh, media. And um, in that film, the climax comes when the United States and the Soviet Union is about to engage in a nuclear holocaust when suddenly a new sun is born in the sky. And what the movie doesn't tell you, Arthur C. Clarke, the author, tells you in his book, the name of that sun is Lucifer. Mm -hmm. And David Spangler telling you, one of the great leaders of the New Age, who spent time at Finhorn, Peter Caddy kind of blessed him as uh, a magnificent leader there. He comes back and he says in one of his books that we are all to take a Luciferic initiation if we're in, to enter the New Age. There are groups around the country, they call themselves transmission groups, where they're busily chanting 666 to try and send out the vibrations that will bring in the force of this great being. And the people that aren't that far into the philosophy, though, that have the spirit guys, like Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who has her spirit guys that perform at some of her uh, many thousands of uh, clinics that she does, mm -hmm. all right? If you have a spirit guide, and you had a spirit guide, we're going to talk about your spirit guides next week. You had a spirit guide named Jesus, who mm -hmm. wasn't Jesus at all. You just mm -hmm. imagined that he was. Uh, it was actually Satan again. But your spirit guides, if they are all controlling people, giving these mind trips, giving these wonderful mystical experiences like Shirley MacLaine is having and other people across our country, and they're saying these are great things and we ought to listen to these ascended masters like Napoleon Hill and so on. So if they're all following different masters and at the appropriate time the masters point to the master, the guru, the leader, People say, how could we all worship one man? Well, if that one man says that he is the highest in the evolutionary process of becoming a god, and he's achieved it, and now he's going to show you how you can achieve full good mm -hmm. godhood just like him, the people will want to worship him, will want to follow him. Let me give you a quick illustration. Marquette University, a fine Catholic university, uh, has PhDs, MDs going across the country for some time now, teaching a course. Uh, Johanna has, well, here was the first world conference on imagery, which they sponsored. Uh, the course is called The Healing Power of the Imagination. And then they went on to give the Ninth American Imagery Conference in Los Angeles. There are groups like this all over the country. Intelligentsia from around the world. Scientists. Yeah. 
imagining things because it's a doorway well, into this into this altered state of consciousness. Let me, let me explain it. Let's go to the um, plush palace of fine arts in San Francisco, where over a thousand people took this particular course, and tens of thousands have taken it. Uh, and it's only one of many similar courses. Uh, these are PhDs, these are scientists, uh, medical doctors, psychiatrists, university professors, leading politicians uh, taking this course. And they're taught to visualize themselves in a beautiful landscape, see an entity approaching, be it animal or human, begin a conversation with this entity, and it will talk back, it will become real. Now, you can read of the experiences of Christians who, when they visualize Jesus in their mind, suddenly he began to do things, he became real. They've made contact with a spirit entity, okay? And in this course, you are taught, this is your inner guide. It is never wrong. It will be with you forever. Now, you don't have to be too bright to imagine the day when millions of these inner guides around the world... Sounds just like will, Star Wars. ...will identify the Antichrist as the good guy and, and you will know, be believed. Wasn't that what Star Wars was saying, Dave? Exactly. The inner guide will be with you to the end? Right. I'll be with you always. Well, uh, E.T. was saying that to the little boy, behold, I'll be with you always. Remember when he put his finger on? Right here. And I'll I've, right I've, there. I've come across Christian tracks. You know, E.T., the, <clears throat> the, the, the enlightenment of E.T. can be yours, Jesus. And they think they're correlating Jesus with a fat snake, you know, who came to mimic the true Jesus. And there are people out there right now, also scientists, who are saying there are thousands of UFOs hanging around, and Jesus was one of them. You know, this is a serious movement that's going on like that. All right, that. we're going to take a break, and we're going to come on back, and we're going we're gonna to wrap this up in terms of the scenario. And there's a lot more we want to tell you, so please hang in there with us. Dave, where does positive confession and the possibility thinking that is coming into the church and is actually a part of the church now, where does this coincide with this overall big lie and the coming deception of the Antichrist? Well, you've got two threads, John, uh, one from psychology and the whole occult ideas. Let me just quote uh, a leading uh, a leader in the uh, Presbyterian Church USA <clears throat> and you can read the book and find out who he is and get the full documentation but he says quote in fact he was the keynote speaker at the recent uh, Presbyterian Congress on renewal that was held in Dallas he said I had and have now a growing belief that we are in the beginning of an exciting new age a new age which I believe is already imminent and will change life for all people upon this globe. Inner space and interspace will become just as important, if not more important, than outer space. Mine is not an isolated hope. Carl Jung stated that in Jesus Christ there is made possible a new rung on the ladder of evolution. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin talks about his dreams for the evolution of a new being and a new society. My dream is that we're on the verge of such a discovery. There are those who believe that through human potential, we're going to bring about a transformation of planet Earth. But if we can really create with our words, you get what you say, we can speak health and wealth and prosperity and healing and peace uh, with our positive confession, our positive thinking and so forth, then we ought to speak this to the whole world. And indeed, this is the logical conclusion that many of the leaders in this movement are now saying, that since we are created to be the gods of this world, Satan stole the dominion, became the god of this world. We're going to take that back. We're going to take dominion of this earth. The wealth and the power of this world is going to flow to us as Christians. We're going to have the greatest spiritual explosion the world has ever seen. A little bit, you know, the Bible talks about apostasy. It talks about Jerusalem being surrounded by the armies of the world, and Jesus has to rescue, and if he doesn't cut those days short, no flesh would be saved. But these people are saying, we're going to take over the world for Jesus. We're going to set up the kingdom for Jesus, and Jesus is going to come and he's going to rule over this kingdom that we've taken over by our positive uh, statements and our, our confession of faith and so forth. Well, and by our wealth. if the real Jesus is going to rapture us out of here, and as First Thessalonians chapter 4 says, we will be caught up together with the dead who are raised to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And you're meeting a Jesus. When you meet him, your feet are planted on planet Earth. You've got problems. You've met the real Jesus, uh, the wrong Jesus, not the real one. And many Christians today forget that Hitler deceived Germany. Even the evangelical Christians were deceived. He did all the right things. He got rid of homosexuality, pornography. He cleaned up the streets, got rid of prostitution. 
He was for positive Christianity, quote, unquote. That's exactly what he stood for. He worked for all the right things, and they were behind him 100%. And I'm afraid that some people could be deceived. And you know, one of the ways that deception is going to come in is through the area of guided imagery and visualization, John, because if you can bring the people to a point of imaging a Jesus who is, according to Scripture, maybe another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel, if you're talking about a Jesus that you can manipulate through right. spiritual laws, through techniques, then you wind up with the kind of Jesus talked about by Morton Kelsey in his book, Healing in Christianity, or in this little book that he wrote called Dreams, A Way of Listening to God. And let me give you a quote that he says here on page 23, and this is a startling one. He says, one of the reasons why modern Christians do not understand Jesus is that they think of him as a university of professor of ethics rather than as a shaman. A shaman is witch a witch doctor. doctor. You know, put feathers on him and, and paint and you've got your regular run-of-the-mill witch doctor. And then lest we misunderstand what he means by shaman, he tells us that in the United States the Indian shaman has once again become very important. He tells us on page 29, that uh, Christianity maintains that the only safe way to pierce the unconscious or to enter spiritual reality is with a leader, Jesus. In other words, Jesus, in essence, has become a spirit guide. Shamanism shows us that even before Jesus, though, God worked among the people. Not according to my Bible. My Bible doesn't talk about latent powers that this neutral force can use for good or evil, depending on your bent. Let, let's explain who Morton Kelsey is. Morton Kelsey is a, a He's priest, a Episcopalian, Episcopalian priest. priest. He's fact, a Jungian psychologist. In fact, he was Agnes Sanford's pastor. Agnes Sanford's very pastor. Very close friend. He teaches at Notre Dame, and you mm -hmm. would find his books on psychology in in some of the finest Christian seminaries today. Yeah. And okay, we've we got to wrap this up because oh. we're out of time, and that would be to say this. Well, you wrap it up for us, Dave, in mm -hmm. terms of... Of, of the total scene, what, what strikes you that you would like to leave with the people? Well, the Bible warns about an apostasy. It's coming. And apostasy means people will be deceived. It means that it won't be an obvious lie, but it will sound, it will be a counterfeit that looks as much like the real thing as possible. Therefore, we've got to be very careful that we're hearing the shepherd's voice, the voice of Jesus, that we're really following his word and not the words of well-meaning people. I mean, we're, we're not saying this to put anybody down. I can be de deluded and deceived as well as anyone else. But we've got to recognize there is a deception and get back to the Word of God and be crucified with Christ. Accept His Lordship in our lives. Let Him have His way and, and live His life through us. Not depend on some power, some potential within me. Okay, we're going to talk in the next weeks to come the parallel lines here between the occult as well as what's happening in the church. What's happening in the secular society, in the New Age movement as you term it, as well as what's happening in the church and such things as the positive confession movement and other things. So please stick with us. What an enthusiastic audience. Welcome to our program tonight. Our two guests are going to be informing us of things they've written in their book. They're saying that there is a great lie that is sweeping across America. A seduction is taking place in our country that is encompassing our people in science, our people in government, people in medicine, psychology, into the United Nations. And it actually encompasses those in the religious world. All of the Christian denominations are being taken in by this lie. Now, that's quite a statement, and we want to find out what they're talking about tonight. And our guests are Mrs. Johanna Michelson and Mr. Dave Hunt. Dave, I'd like to come to you first. There is a man that you have written about in your book. His name is Napoleon Hill. He has written uh, the best-selling book of Think and Grow Rich. And many people that we've had on the program have referred to that book, both Christian and non-Christian. Many people in the secular world, in big business and finance, have referred to that book as being a life-changing book to them, that it helped them. You start off with that book as saying it has a part of this big lie that you say is coming across America. I'd like to know what you're talking about. Okay, John. Um, <clears throat> let me read, first of all, just to back up what you said, um, a quote from a Success Motivation Institute tape. Uh, by Earl Nightingale. Now, Earl Nightingale is probably one of the best-known motivational success mm -hmm. speakers. You'll pick him up on a 
uh, Nightingale Conant Corporation tapes. If you're flying American right. Airlines or other airlines, you know, you can pick these up. He says, without question, he's referring to Think and Grow Rich, without question, this single book has had a greater influence on the lives, accomplishments, and fortunes of more individuals than any other work of its kind. All over the free world, there are literally thousands of successful men in all lines of work who are where they are today because they once bought a copy of Think and Grow Rich. I'd be quick to tell you so. I've sat in richly panel, carpeted executive offices, listened to world famous business leaders and so on. And he says all over the free world, uh, thousands of men whose lives have been changed by this book. I'm telling you that this book is teaching straight occultism. Okay. Uh, the New Testament talks about a revival of sorcery in the last days. Witchcraft. Witchcraft. Uh, and, um, you know, as, as I sit here saying this, I, I know that most people won't believe it. So let me just read what Napoleon Hill himself had to say. Right. Um, now, this is from another one of his books called Grow Rich with Peace of Mind. And I'm reading from... Pages. And these books are on the newsstands even right now. Right. They're all bestsellers. Right. He is the granddaddy of the success, motivation, positive mental attitude world that our businessmen and, and executives, sales managers, etc. are studying. Napoleon Hill declares, quote, Now and again, I have had evidence that unseen friends hover about me, unknowable to the ordinary senses. In my studies, I discovered there's a group of strange beings who maintain a school of wisdom. The school has masters who can disembody themselves and travel instantly to any place they choose to give knowledge directly by voice. Now, it's my contention that these are demons. Unless you believe that there is some school of masters out on the astral plane and that these beings are of some other dimension and they can disembody and travel across the astral plane and materialize right in, in front of you um, if you want to believe in that fine but i think all the evidence would indicate uh, that these are demonic entities who are out to deceive the human race but you you're getting to the point that he talked about these ascended masters that gave him the information tell us okay. how he he uh, right. he talks about that let's read napoleon hill again now i knew that one of these masters had come across thousands of miles through the night into my study. Here's an entity that materializes right in front of him. He's talking to somebody. Okay. I shall not set down every word he said. Much of what he said already has been presented to you in the chapters of this book and will follow in other chapters. It's the foundation of his writings, what he learned from this school of masters. Okay. Here's what the voice said. You have earned the right to reveal a supreme secret to others, said the vibrant voice. You have been under the guidance of the great school. Now you must give the world a blueprint. Okay? And I'm sitting here tonight to tell you that the blueprint for success that was given to Napoleon Hill by demonic entities is literally the foundation of the whole success, motivation, positive mental attitude world that you get out there when you take these courses or listen to these motivational tapes uh, and so forth. And we're going to prove that by not just quoting Napoleon Hill, because if you don't know that, hang in there. We've got others that we're going to quote that have picked this up. And let's, uh, let's give the blueprint. What is one of the main things of the blueprint that he wrote in his book that the Ascended Masters gave to him? Well, they said that whatever the human mind can conceive, the human mind can achieve. Now, this is, number, this is the supreme secret that, that he put into his book. In other words, there is an infinite human potential. This is the foundation of the whole human potential movement out there. That deep within us, there is a potential of infinite wisdom, of infinite power. And we simply need to know how to tap into this potential within us. A actually, if it's infinite, uh, we get into this later, we're, we're gods, you know. And that's where this ultimately leads. Um, so Napoleon Hill... Writing with uh, W. Clement Stone. W. Clement Stone is the insurance man in Chicago. Okay. Right, wrote the book, Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude. Okay, PMA. They coined the phrase. They called it the science of the positive mental attitude. But the science they got from the ascended masters. Right. Keep going. He said, truly, deeply believe you will have great wealth and you will have it. 
Now, this is a counterfeit faith of the sorcerers. Now, this is on the secular side of the fence now. Or, you believe right. it, you'll have right. it. Right. right. Okay. Um, the basis of this is the PMA, positive or this uh, Success Through Positive Mental Attitude book, is a guide for, quote, tapping into the great universal storehouse of infinite intelligence, wherein is stored all knowledge and all facts, and which may be contacted through the subconscious. Now, he says, there is a universal law that we translate into physical reality, the thoughts and attitudes we hold in our minds, no matter what they are. Uh, we have the power to create reality with our minds. And we get in, again, later, positive and negative. That's why you must think positive thoughts, because if you think negative thoughts, you're going to create a negative world out there for yourself. So we are the source of power. Uh, self becomes very important. and. Um, in essence, David, what he is saying is that he's saying you need to look inside of yourself and you will find powers there and there are laws concerning when you look inside of yourself that if you follow these laws will bring you success financially and every other way. Right. So ultimately, we're looking to ourselves. So basically, the courses then help you, give you the information then how to look inside yourself and develop this to achieve wealth and health and, and everything else. Find out who you really are. Okay, who else picked this up? We've got about a minute left before we take a break. What's the next stage? Well, there are a lot of people that picked it up. I mean, the whole world of psychology is centered in self. Uh, you can begin with Freud and Fromm and Jung and Rogers and Maslow and Pearls and uh, Tell me all how of Freud them. started it, how he picked it up. Well, uh, Freud and Jung, most people are not aware of this. Their basic theories were developed under hypnosis. Now, we don't have time to get into this, but hypnosis, in my opinion, is right out of the pit of hell. It puts you in an altered state of consciousness. Someone else is controlling your mind. Well, demonic entities can also control your mind. Some people say, well, if a, you know, if a medical doctor hypnotizes you, that's okay. If an occultist hypnotizes you, you've got problems. I don't think the demons go by those rules. They don't care who hypnotizes you. I don't care if you're wearing a white coat or not. It makes okay. no difference. So, right. so, so Freud said what? He, out of hypnosis, he found information that said what? He hypnotized patients, as did Carl Jung. And under hypnosis... Their patients came out with alleged memories. It's a whole thing we don't have time to get into. The Supreme Court of the State of California, where Johanna and I come from, has outlawed uh, testimony by witnesses who've been hypnotized because they know you can lie under hypnosis, you can be deceived under hypnosis, and when you've once been hypnotized, you can never thereafter tell the difference between a real memory and what may have been wittingly or unwittingly implanted by the hypnotist. And these things are crazy. Why? Why? Tell us why. Slow down and tell us why. <laughs> because it is a primary form of suggestion. You have to make suggestions to hypnotize a person. What's happening in your mind under hypnosis? You're in an altered state of consciousness where you are subject to manipulation. But anyway, it was under hypnosis that their patients came out with memories. Memories of traumas they'd suffered in, in uh, I started to say paralyzed because that's where the psychiatrists are now. First of all, in their early childhood, Freud came out with his theory of psychic determinism that you are what your childhood experiences have made you. Carl Jung came out with the same thing. Then they postulated the idea of an unconscious. The unconscious is the deep silk hat into which the therapist reaches to, to find the traumas and the solution. Uh, and it has all been fabricated under hypnosis. Stanislav Grof went a little farther. He found out that when he gave LSD to uh, schizophrenics, they came out with spontaneous memories of what happened at, uh, in, in the womb. <laughs> And which during is impossible, the birthing process. Which is impossible because the brainstem of a child right. up to the point of even after birth does not record memory, so there's nothing right. there, but they still gave back accurate information. So what you're saying is right. that from your point of view, that Carl Gustav Jung and Freud started building theories from people that they were listening to under hypnosis from their so-called subconscious that gave them the information, and now we've got psychiatrists going back in that same spot and finding out stuff that's even impossible. And you're saying that the source is not what is the sub subconscious, but what, David? It's demonic. I mean, we can document that. I don't know if Johanna wants to jump in here. Johanna, give us one example, talking, if you but, can. Uh, she's had these experiences herself. Well, you know, when Napoleon Hill talks about these guides coming to him, uh, that's the same kind of experience that I had from the time I was 11 years old, seeing these beings who come, they materialize, they're as real as you are standing there or you sitting here. They speak to you, they communicate, you see it in a different sense of seeing, but you know they're there. 
And they can indeed give the kind of information that Napoleon Hill was picking up accurately. Okay. That's why everybody's tapping we're into that stage. We've got to take a break here, and we've got to make a bridge for folks, because we want to say that this started coming from the secular side of the tracks, out of psychology, out of the positive mental attitude, out of think and grow rich. But you're saying that it not only is in the business world where people are turning to information coming from these kinds of sources, but we have picked it up on the Orthodox Christian religious side. The church has picked this up, and we have some of our well-known people that are going to take a break. We'll come back. We'll talk about those, so stick with us, please. Okay, we're back. We're talking with Dave Hunt and Johanna Michelson about a big lie that is going across America that's being imbibed by both secular leaders as well as church leaders. And Dave, we've talked a little bit about the fact that Napoleon Hill, in the business world, gave some advice for how to be successful that actually came out of the occult from the demonic, as, as, as folks in Christianity would say. He said the ascended masters, okay? Whatever people want to do with that, that was picked up by other people, and it's also now come into the church. Give us that bridge. Well, success is the name of the game. Everybody wants to be successful. What's wrong with that? Uh, but you want to take the advice of demons to be successful. Instead of looking to God, you look to yourself. This whole idea of self-love, self-esteem has come within the church now. Uh, one of the major television evangelists has written a book called Self-Esteem, the New Reformation in which he says we're not bad. Uh, we're simply badly informed about how good we are. <coughs> that sin uh, or guilt is a loss of self-esteem. A person is in hell when he's lost his self-esteem. This is what hell is. And um, he says Jesus knew his worth. His success fed his self-esteem. I mean, we've got to esteem ourselves highly if all the power is within. And we're going to be successful as we tap into this power within. He bore the cross to sanctify his self-esteem and he bore the cross to sanctify your self-esteem and the cross will sanctify the ego trip and you remember what the masters of this school of wisdom told Napoleon Hill about the ego you've got to have a have a healthy ego now that's rather a unique view of the cross and uh, this man Dr. Robert Schuller and and I'm not trying to put him down but I think he could be wrong and I can be wrong and I'm willing to be told when I'm wrong and we should all be willing to be told when we're wrong and we need to confront one another when there are differences like this. In Christianity Today, he said, and I quote, I don't think anything has been done in the name of Christ and under the banner of Christianity that has proven more destructive to human personality and hence counterproductive to the evangelism enterprise than the often crude, uncouth and unchristian strategy of attempting to make people aware of their lost and sinful condition. You see, that's very damaging to the human ego and to your sense of self-esteem and self-worth. Uh, we don't want to tell people they're sinners, but we want to build them up. Now, a Christian, uh, a very big man in the Southern Baptist Church, one of the top motivational men, in other words, this is another bridge, he's out there uh, quoting Napoleon Hill and so forth, um, says this, as you accept yourself, you will see yourself as a person who truly deserves the good things in life. Shakespeare said it. This above all to thine own self be true. Now, this is a leading Christian writing this. Once you accept yourself for your true worth, then the symptoms of vulgarity, profanity, sloppiness, promiscuity, etc., disappear. There, my friend, goes your problem. In other words, he's saying, all the problems in the world today are because we don't recognize what beautiful people we are. We don't have a high enough sense of self-worth. Maj another major Christian psychologist, probably the leading one in America, says the health of an entire society depends on the ease with which the individual members gain personal acceptance. Thus, whenever the keys to self-esteem are seemingly out of reach for a large percentage of the people, as in 20th century America, then widespread mental illness, neuroticism, hatred, alcoholism, drug abuse, violence, and social disorder will certainly occur. Now, my Bible tells me, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, in the last days, dangerous times will come. Men will be lovers of self. And the Greek word there is not agape, it's phileo. They will be fond of themselves. They will have a high self-esteem. And because of this, he lists a number of horrible things that will be in the world of the last days. This Christian psychologist is telling us just the opposite. 
He says these things are in society because we have too low a self-esteem. Mm -hmm. So the Bible tells me to set my gaze upon Jesus and that I will be transformed into his image. But now we're being taught, no, build a self-image of yourself as you want to be, and then this power within will transform you into this. And what's so frightening is that that's at the heart of occultism. It's the building up of self that every occultist is seeking to do so that he can evolve to this great higher consciousness, to this new man, the noetic man, that's going to come over and take over the entire world. Yet the Bible says, Jesus said, deny self, take up your cross and follow me. You know, it's not this, uh, this theology of get bigger and bigger and better as Emil Coué was teaching and as I recited forever and ever in mind control. Every day in every way I'm getting better and better and better. And I had one Christian psychologist tell me via a friend who was going to one who said, yeah, look yourself in the eye and pat yourself on the head and give yourself a hug and say, oh, you good thing. You know, reminded me of Harvey sitting under the aspen tree saying, you poor thing, you poor, poor thing in that play. Huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's at the heart of occultism. The, uh, the th reason that you're bringing this up, Dave, and you've documented all the names and the people that we we're talking about, I think we're both sure that they're, they're solid Christians. Uh, all the people we've mentioned uh, concerning Christianity tonight. And we're going to mention some others, okay? And, but the names are mentioned in your book. But the reason that we're bringing it up, in light of the fact that these people will, would, might take offense at this, is because you have a straight statement concerning the self by Jesus. If any man would follow me, let him take up his cross daily, deny himself, and follow me. Now, that there is in direct opposition to building up the self. Now, We've got to talk more about this, and we're just at the tip of the iceberg. We haven't explained the big lie yet. We have, we're just talking about how to get into it. So please stick with us. This is very important. I hope you'll join us next week. Welcome. What an enthusiastic audience. We're glad that you joined us tonight. We have two very important people that are talking about a lie that is sweeping across America. They're calling it a seduction. And it's uh, taking place among some of our top political people in government. It's taking place among our medical people, those in psychology, uh, those in the United Nations, those in science. And it's also bridging over into the Christian church, all the denominations, a lie, a seduction that's taking place. And they are talking about it. Uh, Mr. Dave Hunt, who has just written a book talking about the seduction, and uh, Johanna Michelson is here with us as well, who has lived part of this lie and experienced the results of what happens when you live, uh, you accept this lie. Now, we just started a little bit last week, and we talked, David, about a man on the secular side of the tracks who was giving advice to big business and a lot of people in big business have accepted that advice. It came from Napoleon Hill out of his book Think and Grow Rich and his other books. We were talking about the fact, and why don't you tell us, that where did he get that information that is in that book? Well again, it's, it's uh, incredible to say, but it's true. <clears throat> Napoleon Hill himself says it. I didn't make it up that he got the formula of success that he gave to the world, he was chosen by the masters of a school of wisdom who can disembody themselves and who materialized in his study and told him he'd been under their guidance. He gave a formula of success that they gave to him to the business world, which became the foundation of the whole success, motivation, positive mental attitude world out there. Yeah, Clement Stone picked it up and put it into PMA. And what did Clement Stone say? What were some of the things that he said concerning what he Well, that said? was a book that W. Clement Stone co-authored with Napoleon Hill, mm -hmm. Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude. And this positive mental attitude is the secret to the whole thing because they said that our minds basically have all the power to create our own world. And that what we need to do is have a healthy uh, uh, ego, uh, a, a self-esteem. We've got to build up our sense of our self-worth. To look inside uh, of ourself. And because we are it. And ultimately, as we'll see later, our goal is to become masters ourselves. This is what the masters taught him. And we will ascend up to this higher plane through mind power and become masters ourselves. Now, 
So the whole thing centers in self, and this is what the human potential movement is about, that we have an infinite power within us. Um, Gloria Steinem, for example, editor of Ms. Magazine, says that by, she says, by the year 2000, I have hopes that we will be able to educate our children to no longer believe in God, but to believe in human potential, to believe in themselves, you see? Now, that is what psychology is all about. All psychology can deal with is the self. It comes right out of the same uh, occultism, actually. Uh, Napoleon Hill got his information from Carl Jung, for example, said that the whole subject of psychology is the human psyche. Uh, we're studying the psyche, psychology, knowledge about the psyche. But then he admitted that we don't know what the psyche is. Uh, and we don't know how it works, and we're trying to experiment, and <clears throat> none of our experiments work, so finally we go into Eastern, Eastern mysticism, which is what happened. So this idea of you've got to love yourself, you've got to have a high sense of self-esteem and so forth has come into the church. Now that began with another man, even earlier than Napoleon Hill, <coughs> from the same source. His name was Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche, of course, was a primary inspirer of Hitler. Uh, one of Nietzsche's uh, greatest books titled Antichrist. That book we be begins with these words. We must see ourselves for who we are. Okay? And he goes on to explain uh, who we are. It was Nietzsche who said, your problem is that you don't love yourself enough. You actually hate yourself. Everybody's born with a sense of, of self-hate. Uh, and that was elaborated upon by a psychologist named Eric Fromm. In 1947, he wrote a book called Man for Himself. And he elaborated on this theory that we all innately hate ourselves. We need to, first of all, love ourselves. That's the primary need that we have. And he said, even Jesus taught this when he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, it, well, that's not what Jesus said. No, but it's any, not. Anyway, this was picked up by Robert Schuller then. Uh, the first one in the Christian world, really, who wrote the book, Self-Love, The Dynamic Force of Success. And you will hear today from the best pulpits across America that our primary need, first of all, we've got to learn to love ourselves before we can love others <clears throat> or we can love God. Now, the person who says, I hate myself, I'm so ugly, I got such bad acne, I'm so fat, I'm so skinny, I just hate myself, I say, you don't hate yourself. Were you ever upset because somebody you hated was ugly? Mm. If you hated yourself, you would be glad you're ugly. Uh, the, the truth is, you love yourself, and that's why you're concerned about your appearance. Don't give me this nonsense about hating yourself. Uh, the Bible, I'll hang in there with the Bible. The Bible says, no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it. Okay, a lot of people jump off of the verse, though. Jesus said, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul, and thy neighbor as thyself. So therefore, they're saying you can't love your neighbor until you love yourself, so therefore you have to have self-esteem. You have to build up yourself, and that's biblical. What would you say to that, Dave? Well, we are self-centered. This is why Jesus said to deny self, but we are self-centered, self-serving uh, individuals. We love ourselves. Jesus couldn't say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If we all hated one another and were wanting to do ourselves in, we'd do others in too. Uh, he, he couldn't say, love others, love your neighbors, you love yourself, unless we already loved ourselves, and yet you've got any number of Christian psychologists that will tell us our, our sense of self-love and self-worth is defective. We've got to build it up. Now, there's a psychologist, David G. Myers, who wrote a book called The Inflated Self. And in that book, he says, uh, Jean-Paul Caudal, he was a French psychologist, conducted 20 experiments with French people ranging from 12-year-old school children to adult professionals, Regardless of those involved in the experimental methods, the people's self-perceived superiority was persistent uh, constantly. Now, they've given uh, s similar tests to American students, for example, those who take the SAT when you graduate from high school. Um, and uh, 829,000 uh, uh, high school seniors evaluated themselves in this particular test. In the ability to get along with others, you had to evaluate yourself. How you get along with others as compared to how others get along with others. Zero percent of the 829,000 students who responded rated themselves below average. Sixty percent rated themselves in the top 10 percent. And 25 percent saw themselves among the top 1 percent. 
Now, Dr. Myers comments after, I mean, this is only one. I can give you any number right. of these things. He says, note how radically at odds this conclusion is with the popular wisdom that most of us suffer from low self-esteem. Preachers who deliver ego-boosting pep talks to audience whose audiences who are supposedly plagued with miserable self-images are preaching to a problem that seldom exists. See, we, all, we have always known that pride is the besetting sin of the human race. I mean, I've been on my knees praying for, for humility and, and thought I got it, and the next thing I knew, I was proud I'd become so humble. Uh, now, now, that's a problem that we all have. We always knew that pride is the besetting sin, but the psychologists are telling us, oh, no, if that's not the problem. It's not that you think too highly. We all think too lowly of ourselves. We all have a bad sense of self-worth and mm -hmm. bad self-image, and we've got to build up. Otherwise, we couldn't believe that God loves us uh, if we're, unless we're worth his love, you see? Give so, us a quote out of, uh, an exact quote out of possibility thinking that you feel is in direct opposition to biblical theology. God's almost impossible task is to keep us believing every hour of every day how great we are as his sons and daughters on planet Earth. You know, I would say that's just the opposite of what the Bible says. That's teaches. exactly the opposite, you know. Second uh, Chronicles 7 says, if my people will humble themselves uh, yeah. before me, then I will listen to them. I okay, but to be fair, I've, I've read the article that Shuler wrote, and I think that he would come back and he would say something like this, Dave, <laughs> is that it's not that he doesn't believe that men have uh, these problems. He does believe they have it. What he's saying is he's got a whole bunch of people saying, I'm in uh, Suicide 101 here. I, I have uh, so many problems, I'm ready to cut out. I need help. And he's saying, you don't help them by laying another guilt trip on them, saying you're going to hell, the fact is that your uh, sins are going to pull you down and that you are a dirty sinner, and major on the sin. So it's not that he's saying he doesn't believe that. He's simply saying we've got to take that and put it into a context for the secular mind to believe. So we're going to talk about the potential that you have, and we're going to talk about how we can, uh, with God's help, make you a better person, etc. What would you say to that? Well, I've dealt with such people myself. Let's see. Here's a... Here's a typical case of a man who was threatening suicide because of all the mistakes that he'd made in his life, a wasted life and so forth. Um, and uh, he said, I hate myself. Um, well, I said, if you hate yourself, you would only be too glad to stand in a public courtroom and expose yourself and admit all that you've done wrong and go to prison for it. And you'd be happy to see yourself suffer in prison if you really hate yourself but you're doing everything you can to twist your way out of this and not admit it. But you keep saying you hate yourself. You don't hate yourself. You love yourself. Okay, what is the biblical answer? Because we're not trying to punch holes at anybody here. We're certainly not trying to be divisive. You have brought this up because you simply believe it's not biblical. So what is the biblical answer to this? What we need to do is turn that person from themselves. Either self-derogation or building up self. Let's be done with self. And let's turn from self to the Lord. And let's get our eyes upon Him and realize that as a Christian, I am crucified with Christ. The power is not in me and myself. Jeremiah uh, 10, 23 says, For I know it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. The answer is not in me, it's in the Lord. And if he doesn't know Christ, he needs to invite Christ into his heart. But to start building up his sense of self-worth and self-esteem is absolutely the opposite you will get anywhere in the Bible. For example, the turning point in Job's life. How did that come? Job said, I've heard of thee with the hearing of the ear. Now mine eye seeth thee, wherefore I hate myself. And I repent in dust and ashes. And I don't read that God said, Job, you've got a bad self-image. We've got to build it up. That was a turning point in his life. And you want to get a good, an accurate self-image, don't look in the mirror and build up yourself but get a view of him. And, and Isaiah said in Isaiah 6, in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His, I saw his glory and I said, woe is me. I am undone. So we need to realize that we're sinners. We need to realize that we cannot do it. And Paul said, when I'm weak, then am I strong. And Jesus said to him, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. But we're being deprived of the power of God in our lives by building up self. And it's not biblical. Okay. We're going to also talk about other <coughs> folks in the Christian church that are taking other verses and talking about how we can uh, be healthy. We don't have to be sick. 
and uh, how we can claim these things and have them, and in fact that we ought to do that, and if you're not doing it, you don't have enough faith. We've got to talk about these things, and we're going to. We're going to take a break. We'll come right on back. All right, we're back. We're talking with Dave Hunt and Johanna Michelson. And Dave, I can hear people out there that are saying, hey, you're trying to drag us back to that old worm theology. You're trying to put us into the negative pits. And, uh, you know, why are you so negative? How can you be against all of the, the good Christian guys on television that are trying to lift our spirits and build up self? And, and you know, I really appreciated what they did. And, and now you're giving me the opposite side and putting a guilt trip on me. How can you do this to me? Yeah, well, that's what a lot of people say. Uh, and uh, they'll say, for example, well, I don't see that how anything could be wrong with what he or she teaches because he's so positive. I don't like those words, positive and negative. You just punched a button in me, okay. uh, John. Speak. It sounds like electricity. <clears throat> it has nothing to do with morals. It has nothing to do with whether it's biblical or whether it's true or false. It's a smoke screen to keep us from realizing the real issue is, is what they're saying biblical or not? Is it true or is it false? And people come out with this, oh, it's so positive. Uh, the idea that positive is always right and negative is always wrong. Where did that come from? Go back to the Garden of Eden. You want to know who was negative there? God was as negative as you can get. He said, there's a tree in the middle of this garden. If you eat it, I'm warning you, it's going to kill you. And the positive guy was Satan. He said, don't worry about it. It's okay. Everything's going to be all right. You're even going to become God's. You go to Matthew 16, and Jesus was very negative. He said, you know, I'm going to Jerusalem, they're going to kill me. And Peter was very positive. He says, oh, no, Lord, I know it's, I know it's been going tough for you lately, and you're really down, and, but you've got to keep a stiff upper lip and look on the bright side of life and have a positive confession. It's going to be okay. And you know what Jesus said to him? Get thee behind me, Satan. Uh, so this positive negative, you won't find it in the Bible. Now, of course, that rings a bell with ideas like positive thinking. Because, you see, the power is in our minds. And so if we think positive thoughts or if we think negative thoughts, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make us what we're thinking. People will even use the verses, a man thinks in his heart, so is he, and say, you've got to program your mind with positive thoughts. What's wrong with that? Well, you just misquoted the scriptures. Okay. And uh, I have never yet found a theologian, a pastor, anybody who, can quote, who quotes that right. I mean, I've asked a large audience of a thousand people, and not one could tell me how you misquoted it, and you did it deliberately. Because that's the way everybody says it, and you've heard it wrong so often, you don't know what it really says. And the impression is that as a man thinketh, well, you can change your, what you are by changing your thinking. But it doesn't say that. That's Proverbs 23. And Solomon is giving a specific example, and he's saying to his son, you know, after I'm dead, and you're head of state, and you're out there hobnobbing with big wheels, you know, kings and, and so forth, and they invite you into a feast, and, and this man says, eat up, and, you know, fill yourself, and we'll be buddies, and we'll make a pact, and so forth. Don't believe what he says. You cannot go by what he says, by his words, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Far from telling you that you can change yourself by changing your thinking, he's warning you that you don't know what is really going on in a person's heart, and you better be very careful. And yet we use that verse all the time to reinforce the fact that if you can change the thoughts in your mind, you can change yourself, which is not even biblical. It's taken out of context. Another one is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I believe that. That's a favorite verse that people quote. But they don't give you the context. Paul is writing that from prison. I just spent some time in the Soviet Union a few weeks ago, and I can tell you, I visited Christians who are suffering. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but he wrote it from prison, and he says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be empty, both to abound and to suffer need. Then he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. Obviously, he's emphasizing the suffering, the, the, the deprivation, um, but they, the people who quote this only give you one side of it. It's always success, power, positive. Give us a pos <laughs> positive word. Give us a, a, a word <laughs> of affirmation from the scripture, if a you will. positive confession. Yeah, uh, I see the, so, so much, people are getting frightened by what you're saying, because if this is creeping into the church and it's not biblical, 
we've got to come back to why is that creeping into the church. And you're saying this is part of the big lie, which we're going to get to as we go on through these programs. But I want a word that brings us back to the truth. Can you give us that, Dave? Well, we need to get back to the Word of God. Don't, don't take my word for it. Be like the Bereans who wouldn't even accept what the great Apostle Paul said because of who he was, but they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And part of the problem is we're following some great person on, on television or in a pulpit or whatever. We need to get back to the Word of God. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from the voice of strangers. And I give my sheep eternal life, and they will never perish. And it's, it's very significant that Jesus talks about people who in that day will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do miracles in your name? We prophesied in your name. We cast out devils in your name. I will say to them, I never knew you. And Jesus said, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. We've got to want to know him. And he said, when you seek for me with all your heart, you will find me. Instead of seeking ourselves, trying to get in touch with ourselves and find out who we are in touch with our feelings, which is what the New Age says, you're separated from your higher self. We're separated from God by sin. And we need to have a thirst and a passion to know him and come to him for who he is and on his terms. Okay, we're going to talk in the next weeks to come the parallel lines here between the occult as well as what's happening in the church. What's happening in the secular society, in the New Age movement as you term it, as well as what's happening in the church and such things as the positive confession movement and other things. So please stick with us. Welcome. Welcome to our program tonight. You know, ever since Shirley MacLaine wrote her book, Out on a Limb, as well as uh, some of the popular magazines have picked up some of the stories that she has written, there seems to be a widespread feeling across America that psychic occurrences and uh, miraculous happenings and out-of-body experiences is just kind of passe. That's just everyday happening, you know? And you're... you're uh, uh, you're limited if you haven't had one of those experiences. And here, let me give you five techniques of how you ought to get one. All right? We're talking with a lady that went through all of that. And uh, you'll see a little bit about her book a little bit later on. It's called The Beautiful Side of Evil. And Joanna Michelson is our guest tonight. And she was telling us how she came into having her mystical experiences, having a spirit guide that she herself picked out. And uh, Joanna, let's go back on that story and tell the folks uh, how you got into it. As a college graduate, uh, and all the things that you experienced, the beautiful side of evil, if you want to call it that. Well, for many, many years, the forces that were around, and I was very cognizant of them, manipulated me at will and left me wondering if I was losing my mind. I know there are many people who see figures on the side of their bed or hear voices or know what's going to happen or see bizarre things coming at them in the middle of the night, wonder if they're losing their minds or just plain hallucinating. But those things can be very, very real. I'm not saying every manifestation like that is, but yeah, there's let, a source. Let, let's stop but. here and let me say this. We have never done a program like this because there are a lot of people that usually watch the program that say, Ankerberg, you have flipped right out here mm -hmm. uh, to do this program on the supernatural and to come in on the occult this strong. Let me tell them the reason that we've done this so that you can continue so they don't think somebody else showed up this week to be the host. Um, the reason we're doing it is because of the mail that you've sent in. Enough of you have said that you're involved in these kinds of things that we wanted to hit it head on and talk about it. And we wanted to put a biblical perspective to what we're talking about. And uh, our guests on the program tonight can do this very well. Joanna, continue. The long and the short of it is, is that I needed something to give me a sense of control. I didn't know what that was. And I blundered into a course called Silva Mind Control which is teaching you how to gain mastery over yourself, over your alpha brain waves. Mm -hmm. Through this course, we were introduced to counselors. I, being a Christian, I accepted the Lord as my Savior my freshman year in college, asked for Jesus. What better guide can you have? So what that I eventually wound up considering him my guru, my spirit guide, the greatest medium of the seventh sphere. He was my Jesus, as I imagined him to be. After all, what difference does it make how you image him? As long as he's there, you've got the real one. That's what I thought. When you say counselor, now what did you mean? Well, someone who would be with me at all times, who could I, I, whom I could conjure at will, who would be there to give me information that I could not otherwise obtain. Like in Star Wars? 
the force of Star Wars is very much like that. Lucas was deliberately giving a religious perspective there, and we're indoctrinating millions of people, and especially the children, into learning how to deal with these neutral forces. But I was it coming. It would be like Obi Wan. Like Obi Wan Obi -Wan, Kenobi. Wan, after he That's died. That's right. After he died, mm -hmm. he came back, and he was guiding Lucas through this. You know, he, when he said. When I, if I die here, I'll come back in even greater power. So that's power. the kind he of counselor it. you're talking about. This is the kind of counselor we're and talking you about. you picked Jesus. Obi Wan Kenobi. Mine was Jesus. And eventually Darth Vader became one of those two. That's right. He? Eventually Darth Vader did too. Mm -hmm. Be fun to see what else comes down on that pike. But in any case, through these people in mind control, I met a woman in Mexico City who is one of the few genuine. Was she's dead now? A psychic surgeon. And John, she did things that defy description. That most people say, look. Johanna, you had to be hypnotized, you had to be, maybe you're lying. Who knows what ulterior motive you have. You know, the one book came out from the Christian perspective implying that anybody who sees this kind of thing is lying or deluded, as another book has recently said. But John, all I can tell you is I had my hands on it. I was with this woman, sometimes from early morning, working through making herbal preparations, grinding up snakes and whatnot, uh, visiting with people who would come for spiritual advice and counsel. And then for the evening sessions, which is when she did the actual operations, I'm the one who set things up. Okay, now this was a lady about how old? Bachita at that time, I don't know. She was in her early, mid-70s. I forget exactly how old Okay, now. and she would put herself into a trance? She would sit down in front of this altar. Her people... A crucifix on the altar. With the crucifix on the altar, the picture of Jesus. She would sit down, take deep breaths, relax, put herself into her own trance state, and the spirit would come, take over. From that point on, she was no longer referred to as Pachita. It is now Hermanito, little brother. Full masculine male traits. Figure. Her eyes were tightly shut. I once watched her thread a needle with her eyes tightly shut. I can't do it with my eyes open. And in that state would perform literal physical operations on certain individuals who had been selected uh, over a period of time who were told they had operations that needed to take place. The patient, for example, well, let me give you one that took place on a surgeon. There was a medical doctor who was there as her assistant. After the operations, she would st he would stand back and say, I can't believe what I saw. It usually takes me hours. Full qualified no medical surgeon was down there helping her? Ac an actual medical surgeon. He had his own practice in Mexico City at the time. Pachita, hermanito, always had two helpers, a male on one side of the cot and a female for about 14 months, myself, as often as I could get into the city assisting. And I would set up the cotton, the implements that were to be used, primarily a rusty hunting knife and a pair of scissors. The spirit would come and the operations would commence. The patient would come, stretch out on the cot, bear whatever section of his anatomy needed the operation. The only uh, uh, concession to antiseptics was a bit of cotton that was rubbed on the section, new cotton from a bottle they brought. And, you know, John, what can I tell you? I did not go buy chicken gizzards at the market across the street. She was not putting little bits of mica underneath her fingernails through which superficial cuts were made. I was not hypnotized. I had my eyes open. I, count, I stopped counting when I assisted in over 200 operations. Everything from, from uh, inoperable brain tumors to lung transplants, which Andre Pujarich, who researched a book on Arigo, another psychic surgeon in, in Brazil, and other uh, uh, psychics that he's researched, he said she's probably one of the greatest psychics because he assisted in an operation in which he did an actual transplant. Let me just jump in and say Andre Pujarich, who <laughs> brought Uri Geller yeah. here also is a brilliant medical scientist with about 60 patents to his credit. His right. no, someone not easily deluded, despite what the skeptics would say. You know, okay, I watched, keep going. I stopped counting at 200 uh, of these operations. Uh, John, I had my hands in them. I had blood up to my forearms. Let's, let's tell them what actually you saw. Go ahead. All right, there's one operation in which uh, I assisted in a lung transplant. What, well, did, what took place? Well. The woman was stretched out on the cot on a sheet that she had brought. The spirit took the pair of scissors, raised them in a salute to whatever force he was raising it in, plunged them into the woman's body, cut deeply into the flesh, had me part the cavity to one side, and I could feel the blood pulsing over my hands. You know, then Pachita, hermanito, so you don't get confused, the spirit brought out a dirty red handkerchief with a piece of lung. Sometimes we got the parts from uh, cadavers. She had friends in the uh, morgue in town. Sometimes it was animal parts. Frankly, psychic surgeons will tell you it doesn't matter what piece you're using. It really doesn't. But doctors have taken blood samples and verified them to be those of the patients. Something was taking place there. She took this uh, lung, dirty red rag and all, John, and slipped it into the woman's chest cavity. 
then passed the hand, his hand, over the woman's chest, and it closed instantly. Not many people knew that that's what happened. We bound him up, the woman up, in a, a bandage that she had brought with cotton underneath, gave her instructions for three days, and the woman was healed. Now, I could, I've what, documented what many operations. Uh, uh, what was the problem? She had degenerative lung condition. Mm -hmm. That's all we knew. Mm -hmm. uh, a little boy who was born dumb, who couldn't speak, and Manito opened up his throat, pulled out a hairy rock, materialized a hairy... I mean, you don't walk around with hairy rocks in your throat, right? The spirits materialized this, removed it, and that little boy said his first words ever. My father was assisting in that operation. The doctor himself that I was telling about, the surgeon with his practice there, he had a hernia operation. My father was there for this one, too, and he was describing in medical terminology, yes, I can feel now, Manito, you've cut through this layer and that layer. Yes, you've reached it. That's where the pain was. I gave him the needle and thread, which Manito had threaded previously, sewed it up, and two hours later, the doctor drove himself home, perfectly healed of his hernia. An accountant who has given me a notarized certificate of his operation, who said, yes, I had this huge lump there, and I'd seen it before, and he's a personal friend of my family's. After the operation, the lump was gone. You have documented these things in your book in the sense, not documented where you had photographs and so on, but you kept a <laughs> diary while you were going along, mm -hmm. just your everyday diary. And I think you ought to tell the people who, after you came to know the Lord and came out of this, which we're going to tell in a moment, who it was that encouraged you to go back in that diary and helped you to put these things into the book. Well, uh, that was Dr. Walter Martin. I met Dr. Uh, Martin in Mexico in 1973 during a, a Bible conference. I had become a Christian in 1972, in November. And I met him, I told him my story, and he said uh, about a month or so later, you know what, we need to document this, we need to, to put a book out on this. So it's because of his... Uh, the Christian Research Institute, most people in evangelical Christianity know Dr. Walter Martin, and mm -hmm. uh, also Hal Lindsey also mm -hmm. encouraged you and actually wrote the foreword to your book after <coughs> being with you and talking to you and listening and checking with other people. And he actually says that, that when he first heard it, he couldn't believe it and had to check around. Okay? I just wanted people to hear that. Okay, so you were doing all of these things. What was happening in your mind? Because uh, the Spirit had told you that you were the one that was going to be picked to take over this psychic surgeon's place when she passed off the scene. That was going to be your job. You were thrilled to be able to have that high honor because you thought you were going to help people. Okay? What happened then? Well, I did not become a full trans medium. Why? That, that's an interesting question. I think it's because the Holy Spirit was interfering. There was one night I was assisting in an operation, and all of a sudden the Spirit looked up with the one flash of hatred I ever seen, had ever seen on his face toward me and said, get her out of here. You know, she needs a, a limpia, a cleansing. And then he mumbled under his breath, even though there's a greater spirit looking after her. And he said it with such venom, it startled me. I didn't know what that meant. You didn't know what it meant. I'm sure now it's the Holy Spirit who was protecting his exceedingly dumb child. Okay, we're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about uh, how it was that you came out of all of this and how the blinders were taken off so that you found out who your real spirit guides really were. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about that. Please stick with us. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. We're talking with Joanna Michelson. We're going to finish up the story, but the last 15 or so years, there's been a, just an explosion of psychic phenomenon that's going on across our country. And the question we're asking tonight is the source from which that phenomenon comes. Is it always good? Is it always God? Is it always beautiful? And Johanna, uh, up to this point, things were really humming along as far as you were concerned, except you couldn't figure out why the spirit that was inside of Paquita said to you that uh, get her out of here at that one spot. You just kind of filed that away and uh, now the story went on. Why was it that you finally left Mexico City to take a break? Well, the main reason was I felt I needed to put some distance between myself and the activities Why? that were going on there because I wanted to see if maybe in a different location I could be more centered so that I can get in tune with the spirit guides. I could see them. I couldn't understand why they weren't taking possession in full trance. No, the reason you left was because you had been promised to be this full-fledged yes. uh, trance medium, yeah. if you want, and, a and number it wasn't of other discrepancies place. as well, John. So I went to Switzerland. Well, Switzerland is a ways down. But in any case, let me just get to Switzerland. I decided the best place to get away was England. The Duncommon exhibit was on there. So I went to England, wandered around for two months, having very bizarre, frightening experiences. Uh, 
Finally, I went to see my sister in Italy, who was a, she was a committed, born-again believer at the time. And, and you were afraid me, that she was going to talk to you about the Lord, and she did. Well, you know, yeah, she sure did. And what she did was exceedingly obnoxious to me at the time. She asked me questions. Johanna, how do you know that the guides who are coming to you, that the ones you're seeing working through Pachita are the ones who they claim to you? Well, that's miraculous. Yeah, but how do you know? Is it possible that there are some miracles that are not from God? Is it, you know, a whole bunch of questions that she so asked So she was me. smart enough to say that you could have all the miracles there. She believed in the miracles. She was just saying, check the source. Well, yeah. And that's, that's what bothered right. you? The question that came to my mind was, is it possible that I'm wrong? With all the barrage of questions she asked me about reincarnation, about uh, the cosmic consciousness, about all of these things, yoga, which I was teaching at the time, basically what sifted down into my mind was, is it possible I'm wrong? And I said, I prayed, I said, Lord Jesus, you know more than anything else, I want to serve you. I believe that this is what you are, my guru, spirit guide, etc. But if she's right, if there's something else, I want to know. So and I'm happen. willing to give up all of this that I'm involved with. If you prove to me you're right, but you better show me, God. Mm -hmm. I wound up at a place called Abri. Uh, Dr. Francis Schaefer, one of the great theologians of our age who has since gone home to be with the Lord, was there. And I'd had a run-in with him before. I thought he was very narrow-minded, very dogmatic, and I'm afraid I pretty came, came pretty close to insulting Edith Schaefer, the Lord bless her for her patience. But I told my sister, I said, Kim, look, if one narrow-minded, Bible-thumping, dogmatistic evangelist tries to convert me, I'm leaving. I don't want to put up with that at this Christian center. Mm -hmm. She said, go and find out. So I went. I spoke to Dr. Oz Guinness, the author of The Dust of Death. He was compiling his book at that time. Even he couldn't get through to me. But I will tell you more than anything else I wanted to know, and I said, God, show me. The long and the short of many experiences and many demonic battles that I had, although I didn't recognize them as such, was one night when I was on my way to Bertie's chalet. Bertie was one of the counselors with whom I was sharing. Thinking about something totally irrelevant, suddenly, John, out of the literally clear blue sky, this blackness enveloped me, and I heard voices whispering in my ear, my right ear, in a cold, chill breath on the side of my neck, and a presence of evil unlike I'd ever felt, and believe me, I had felt some during my college years, but when I began working with the medium, when I began working with mind control, I would simply center myself, call on my good guides, surround myself in the white light of Jesus, and these things would leave. I thought I had it made, but here it was, and I couldn't conjure it away. I, I tried calling on the name of my, my uh, guide, Jesus. He can't help you. We're going to kill you, the voices shrieked, and I, and I was trying to call on Cuauhtémoc. But she does guide, and they shrieked even louder, and I broke into a panic. I started to run in the darkness. And suddenly, John, what I can only describe as a fist, came through, hit me in the back, pitched me forward. I couldn't even call on the name of Jesus at this point. But the Lord knew, and he rescued me from that. I ran into the medium's room, the, I'm sorry, uh, the counselor's room, uh, Bertie. She said, what's the matter with you? I was covered with mud took me into a little room to pray for me. I couldn't even hear her. We were swept up in a giant whirlwind some, somehow in my mind. Her voice was far away, and suddenly I heard voices to my left. John, there was a little window to my left, kind of where you're sitting there, Dave, and I could see the faces of demons outside that window shrieking in a rage I'd never experienced before. That was you the know first what? time that you saw yeah. what the real faces were. I knew instantly in a flash as clearly as I knew anything at all that these faces were manifesting in response to my wanting to know the truth as the source behind the medium with whom I was working. God took the veil aside and instead of these angels of light that I was seeing manifested, those true beings were out there shrieking in an undescribable rage. And I knew that that rage was over my potential decision to accept Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Jesus of the Bible as he says he is instead of as I had subtly come to redefine him to be. I was using all the terminology of Christianity, but I had redefined it so that you would never recognize it as the Jesus of the Bible if you really pinned me down to it. And I gasped, Bertie looked out that window, commanded them to depart in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and they left. And I said, you know what? That's the Jesus I want to get to know. I don't have a lot of answers. I still don't know about reincarnation. I still don't understand about all of these things, with the Ouija board and all of that, but I know one thing. That Jesus had reality, and mine left me hanging in the lurch. That's the one I wanted to So how did to you know. get to know the real Jesus? Well, two days later, Oz Guinness and uh, Sheila Bird and I gathered together. I prayed, and I accepted him. And then the battle began. Then I had to go home and face the demons in the house. Then I had to struggle through, well, is mind control a neutral technique? As at that point, maybe they thought it was in, uh, at Labrie. 
or is it demonic? I went through a long period of struggling, but you know what I said? I said, if there's a personal living God, and if he has said something to me in guiding me through this life now, then he said something about the activities I've been involved with. And I began to look through scripture, and I came across passage after passage that made my blood run cold. For example, the Levitical passages. Well, let me give you Deuteronomy 18 first where the Lord there, speaking through Moses to the children of Israel, covers the full gamut of occult activity, ranging from superstitions to fortune-telling, which includes palm reading, astrology, Ouija boards, <coughs> the I Ching, the tarot cards, hundreds of different forms of seeking into the future for information, the practices of magic, the practices of mediumship and spiritism. It covers the full gamut of occultism and calls it abomination. Evidently, regardless of how sincere you were or not, was irrelevant. All of it was labeled abomination, including the mediums and the spiritists and the ones who call up the dead. And I said, ah, that's what I've been doing. I've been working with the medium. And then in Leviticus, where the Lord gave specific commandments, in Leviticus 19.31, for example, where he says, do not turn to the mediums or the spiritists. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. And then he gives us the reason for that narrow-minded, bigoted statement, I am the Lord your God. We have one minute left, Joanna, for people that are watching in, that their story is exactly your story, and they're saying, Johanna, I can't go to Switzerland. How do I find the real Jesus? I don't know if I'm deceived or not, but I got doubts. And I want to know for sure, what, what would you suggest? I would say the first thing is, do you really want to know the truth? The second thing you need to do is find out which Jesus you're following. Is the God of the Bible real? Which Jesus are you talking about? Are you talking about God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, God incarnate in human flesh, who lived the sinless life, died upon the cross for the redemption of mankind for your sins? The one who died in the flesh, who arose in the flesh, who ascended into heaven? Or are you talking about another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel? The second thing that you need to look at is, what does the Bible have to say about it? It's not enough for you to say, well, my psychic power has to be from God. I'm using it for good, and after all, I'm seeing Jesus. If the Bible is categorically condemning occult activity, spiritism, witchcraft, necromancy, astrology, etc., in the scriptures, then he's not going to turn around in the New Testament and change his mind. So you need to recognize that what you've been practicing is abomination. What do you do about that? First of all, you confess it to the Lord. You say, God, I confess to you. I didn't know it. I was sincere. I was just joking when I was playing around with a Ouija board when I was four and five and six years old. I didn't mean it when I was trying to call down spirits and promise to give them myself if they would give me power. I was just joking. Guess what? They're not joking. They're not joking. But if you confess it, if you renounce it, which legally shuts the door on Satan, officially turn your back on him and say, Satan, I renounce you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I will no longer have anything to do with this. Then the Lord has said, that he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us. Then learn the principles of fighting spiritual warfare. Study the word. Get involved in a church that understands spiritual warfare, because if you've been in involved in the occult, you're going to have warfare. You're going to come under attack. But know this, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That he might destroy the works of the devil. That's what you need to understand that he made a public display of Satan on the cross, it tells us in Colossians chapter 2. And if you commit your life to this Jesus, if you understand your position in him, then on the basis of that authority, not your self-esteem, not your positive imaging, not your mental powers, not your late natural abilities, but on the basis of his shed blood on the cross, you can take authority over those beings and even command them in the name of the Lord Jesus to depart from you, and they will. And also the fact of if you're tied to that via your family, renounce that and all the ties. Listen, four ways it comes down. One is through inheritance, all right? The sins of the fathers are visited on the children to the third and fourth generation. The second way is by the laying on of hands. I think that's one reason scripture tells us don't lay hands on people too quickly. Powerful mediums can transfer their occult abilities to people through the laying on of hands. Another way is through experimentation. And you say, oh, I wasn't involved in the occult, by which we mean I ain't no Satan worshiper. I had one young man tell me that. Satan couldn't care less. He is the ultimate legalist. If, if God you open said, the door to him, he'll take open advantage. The door, he'll take advantage. He is the ultimate legalist. What's you know, the like fourth? the Russians. You may be flying over their territory. You may be very sincere. They're still going to shoot you down, right? They've given a sample proof of that. Satan will do the same thing. You trespass on his territory that God has warned you about and called abomination, and you're open to it. Didn't the Lord say to us when they say to you in Isaiah, consult the mediums and the wizards who chirp and mutter? He said, should not a people consult their God? 
Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? He says, to the law and the testimony, if they don't speak according to this word, there's no truth in them. Quickly, what's the fourth one? The fourth one is devil subscription, as many of the metal rock, the heavy metal bands of today are doing. Satan, we give you our soul now. You give us popularity. You give us money. You give us power. And that's happening today. And our young people are flocking to Satanism now on unprecedented And if they've done that, and if they've been involved in that, do what? To confess it, to renounce it, to learn how to fight spiritual warfare, to study the scriptures, Wo who and what you are in Christ, and to stick to this. And invite the real Jesus to come and into your life. invite the real Jesus to come into your life. Join us next week. We're going to have questions from the audience on all that you've heard. And uh, thanks for being with us this week.